Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here and joining the show for Monday Morning Murph is, of course, Brian Murphy. Uh, Brian, just give me a reaction. Go ahead. Say what's on your mind. Vikings over 49ers. Very impressive win. How are you feeling on this Monday morning? Feeling good because there's a lot to talk about. I'm feeling good because there's a lot of positive energy, a lot of positive vibes. Um, if anything, it's bought them a tremendous amount of goodwill and time. I'm speaking of the Vikings in this kind of brutal first half. Uh, lo and behold, look who's sitting pretty undefeated and in first place, first place alone atop the NFC North. Uh, you know, two games awfully early in this marathon, but, you know, the difference between 0 and 2 and even 1 and 1. I mean, I think everybody was thinking, boy, if they could just hang tight with the 49ers, maybe cover that touchdown spread, uh, that'd be enough of a jumping off point for the rest of this kind of brutal stretch. But now we've got a, we've got a complete recalibration of, of expectations. I think, uh, you know, among the media, certainly probably the national media, you know, Vegas had them at 6.5 wins and they're already a third of the way there. So I feel like, you know, you can, you could feel just in the comments and the, and the talk out of the locker room yesterday, there's a lot of confidence oozing out of this roster. And it's not that sort of, Hey, we told you all finger wagging. No one believed in us. It was sort of a, Hey, we had some belief in here. Uh, maybe we weren't, uh, confident enough to share it with everyone, but we felt like we had a pretty good football team. The way that defense is really gelling together under Brian Flores, I think that was a f you know a full blossoming of what you saw yesterday. And then of course Sam Darnold, um, you know, it, it's going to be proven every week for him. But you know nobody's really paying attention to what he did in the Meadowlands. Let's see what you can do against a Super Bowl caliber defense and an aggressive defense. Uh, and boy, that fifty yard missile. Uh, you know, I'm guessing if Justin Jefferson puts on a gold jacket in another 10 or 15 years, that that play, that pitch and catch uh, from deep in the end zone to midfield will probably be on his highlight reel. So plenty to unpack, um, plenty to scrutinize still, but they have, uh, the Vikings have really recalibrated expectations to the point now where, you know, if they're not in playoff contention in January, it would be a disappointment, not an obvious conclusion to what everyone thought the season would be. Yeah, I was trying to decide for myself whether I should change my season prediction, because after watching camp, I still felt like they could finish the season with a winning record. So I don't think I want to move the needle too much because I already had them above 500 at nine and eight when we did the whole pick the schedule at the end of training camp thing. And the main reason was, and I enjoyed hearing Jonathan Grenard say this because I was like, Hey, I've been saying this. Uh, Jonathan Grenard said when they went to the joint practices in Cleveland and they played so well as a defense that they all kind of looked around and said, you know, we could be pretty good. And then right after that, I thought the timing well, it wasn't a coincidence that they upped the offer to Stefan Gilmore and Stefan Gilmore becomes a Minnesota Viking. Uh, I think one of the other teams that was interested was Carolina. So I believe after two weeks, Mr. Gilmore is very happy with his choice to be a Minnesota Viking, but uh, I thought it was no coincidence that they had done as well as they did against other competition as a defense and just needed this one other player in Stefan Gilmore. And at that point, it looked to me like they could be, uh, a pretty good team, a pretty competitive team, but beating San Francisco in the way they did Murph as weird as the game was in terms of fumbles and interceptions and crazy things happening. I didn't think that it was fluky. Sometimes even when you're on the good side of things, you lose a game and you go, well, it's kind of fluky. We had a few things that were weird that happened, but despite, you know, they block a punt and so forth. There were some of those things, but they kind of evened out on both sides. The fact that the Vikings were able to overcome a fumble by Aaron Jones that would have put the game on ice and an interception in the red zone. Normally you turn the ball over twice in the red zone. You can count on not winning. I thought that was the part to me when we talk about expectations that raises the bar a little bit because they didn't need just goofy stuff to happen against the 49ers to win a game like this. No, and if you if you want to talk fluky, I mean, you know, you could almost argue that the, the this would have been a blowout, uh, but for those red uh, red zone turnovers that San Francisco quickly turned into points. And yeah, the 49ers put up 400 yards 
of offense. It wasn't as if they were irrelevant. It wasn't as if uh, the defense just put a wet blanket over them. They made critical plays at critical times. Uh, I guess they call that in baseball high leverage moments. I mean, when you think about the fourth down stops, uh, how good the Vikings were on third down, I think they stopped eight of 10. Um, You know, the turnovers that they created, the havoc that they wreaked, it was really just... You know, even Purdy, I think you had written in your your uh, account this morning, uh, was caught on a, a San Francisco area camera when he was hugging Brian Flores saying just great scheme, you know, as if to say, look, you you won the chess match and we'll acknowledge that today. I mean, it really was um, it wasn't a dominant performance. It was performance with some dominant moments and they were at key moments. And they were, you know, where where I feel like, you know, teams are kind of forged in adversity a bit. Um, The Vikings did in in New York as well, showed some resilience. That CJ Ham fumble could have been an easy, you know, here we go again moment that just feeds into the, the Vikings can't control the ball in the first quarter, they fall behind and then everything's a scramble. Um, There were moments, uh, I think yesterday where that damn could have broken as well. I'm Aaron Jones fumble at the goal line was one of those moments where you're like, you know, that would have, that would have been the dagger what's coming next now. And, you know, the fact that the 49ers were able to, to score twice off of those turnovers, that's all they did. I mean, they, you know, impressive 99 yard drive, but at the same point, uh, the Vikings were able to make key plays at key moments. And those are the kinds of plays that fuel confidence, the kinds of plays that get the sideline going, get the offense realizing, you know, this is going to be a, um, complimentary team. I think that's one of the, the takeaways I've got so far is that they're playing complimentary football. I, there were question marks, so many question marks about what Sam Darnold could do. Would the line protect him? Would he be able to get the ball to Justin Jefferson after JJ gets his payday? Well, the defense, which was retooled, I think has made sort of the, some of the, the largest strides. And I think, you know, a lot of the comments that were coming out of the room yesterday was how quickly this unit has gelled how everybody seems to be getting along, everybody's getting a bite at the apple, and it kind of feeds on itself. So I think this is going to be a team led by its defense uh, for the time being. And if Sam Darnold can overcome an interception like he had yesterday, which was pretty ghastly, but also take sheer the top off a of defense like he did yesterday with that, and the fact that O'Connell had the trust in Sam Darnold to take a five-yard drop in his own end zone and unleash into double coverage uh, against one of the best defenses in the NFL and to watch Jefferson not only bring that ball in, but actually make, I think, the touchdown happen with his yards after the catch. I mean, you can't underestimate how that what, that electrified the building, how it electrified the sideline, and it all of a sudden lets you know they've got an NFL uh, quality quarterback with a huge arm that we've heard about we finally got to see it and we have a defense with playmakers who are swarming everywhere and feeding off of each other. Look, 2 and 0 is a great place to be. They got another challenge with Houston coming in at home next week. Uh but I don't feel as I don't you know with Jordan Love's status uncertain, I don't feel as jittery about the Vikings walking into Lambeau Field in 2 weeks. And you know the Lions look a little vulnerable if not completely uh, together yet after a couple of games the bears seem to be scuffling this division seems more wide open than it was going to be maybe a detroit green bay uh runaway train and that's why they play the games of course it is (laughs) of course it is Uh, and that's why they, they they give you nine months to talk about it too Right. Uh, But it was one of the most impressive victories, I think, from a coaching perspective, because uh, nobody's ever going to be perfect. And I uh, did not ask uh, post game if Ty Chandler was going to try to throw a pass there at the end. But if you you know, he was (laughs) don't like that. Don't like that. There, so there were a few things uh, from the coaching perspective that we can always second guess uh, no matter what happens. But to beat San Francisco twice in the Vikings building is a very, very good look for Kevin O'Connell and Brian Flores. And I feel like this connection between those two, it's not always the case that an offensive and defensive coordinator are very much 
in their roles solidified and are on the same page with how they want things done. And it feels like with these two, that is very much the case. I, I do want to talk more about uh, Sam Darnold because you know, Darnold to me has looked like he's playing with a lot of confidence through these first two weeks. And normally you might say, well, you know, he's a quarterback of the NFL. He should be playing confidently, right? He's a big, strong guy, but I think that confidence was a huge deal for him and building that in the first week and then into this game and Kevin O'Connell and his interactions with Sam Darnold and how much care he has shown for Sam Darnold, even though we all know that JJ McCarthy is looming in 2025, unless Darnold wins MVP, then uh, he might come back. I don't know, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. The point is that the way when we talk about the coaching and we evaluate that, we love to rip apart fourth down decisions. Oh, this play call didn't work and things like that. But I think if we're evaluating Kevin O'Connell, this connection with the way that Kirk changed over the two years that he was here and in, in, in terms of his leadership, and now the way that Sam Darnold is confident enough to let a throw rip toward Jalen Naylor in the biggest situation there and, and, and get a huge completion and not check it down or not hold on to the ball too long and just feel like he was in command yesterday. That looks like, and I'm not saying he is this, but it looked like someone who feels like he's a franchise quarterback. He didn't he act like, Oh, I'm just here for a year. There's no, Oh, well, he's just trying to game manage or just trying to get through it. He was playing confident. I'm the star of this team type of quarterback. And I didn't know if I was going to see that against San Francisco in the way that we saw it against the New York giants. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of buzz, and rightfully so. There's a lot of people talking about the 50-yard missile to Jefferson and the big play and the big arm and the big moment like that. But I think you could argue that the 14-play drive there in the fourth quarter that forced San Francisco to chew up their timeouts and, as you mentioned, the big third-down conversion to Naylor down the middle uh, in between two to three defenders. Um, I think it was Brian O'Neill that said that was a big boy throw in a big play, big boy moment. I think that was the best quote out of the locker room that I saw because, you know, letting it fly is really just trusting your offensive line to keep you protected in the end zone. And then just using your God given natural talent to let a ball fly to the best wide receiver in the league, expecting him to beat uh, double coverage is not as uh, thorny as taking over. You know, you could sense San Francisco might've been coming. They might've been smelling, an opportunity uh, to steal this game. And, you know, it was a very ugly interception that Darnold threw over the middle driving down the field earlier. But be, to be able to respond with the drive that essentially snuffs out an opponent, um, those are the kinds of moments that are going to pay off. I don't know how many times Darnold's had a chance to do that in his career. I mean, you probably have looked at his, his game performances more. But with that record and those toxic environments he was in prior to coming to uh, settling down in San Francisco behind Purdy and then coming here, how many times was Darnold in a position to deliver the dagger and to snuff out an opponent with a 14 play clock chewing drive like that? Uh, those are the kinds of moments that he can draw upon again, as we get into these November, December games where every drive, every possession just takes on that much more urgency. So it's interesting to see how he's developing into a, a game manager, but B, a big play guy who can also protect the football and make the key throw at the key moment uh, to keep your defense off the field and then to allow the Vikings to almost cruise to a win uh, in a game that no one expected them to come close to. So these are little things that add up, lots of little things that add up that we can look back on in the second half of the season and draw upon that San Francisco game and be like, okay, that that was a notch, not only to take down a quality opponent, but what it does to the mindset of a team later on, I think this is going to pay off in spades. Well, I think that really is the question here because they are going to face the Houston Texans. I was incredibly impressed with their defense. Uh, Chicago has a good defense, so I wasn't surprised that they held down the Texans uh, to some extent, and that's going to be one heck of a battle for them with CJ Stroud, Stephon Diggs uh, revenge game, as well as uh, Nico Collins, who's a phenomenal receiver. So we'll, we'll get to all that and break that down as uh, the week goes forward here. But I think everything through two weeks has to be looked at 
of what is this going to be in a few weeks and building this foundation of trust between O'Connell and Darnold and the fact that Flores seems to have everything that he's going to work with uh, through the rest of the season with these veteran players that he could do a lot with. I saw some screen grabs of people who are X's and O's showing, hey, Flores played a coverage from this alignment that I've never seen before and stuff like that. He had everybody at the line of scrimmage and then somehow played a what they call a Tampa two, which would be very unusual to see <laughs> something like that. And that's probably what Brock Purdy was referring to when he said your scheme is crazy to uh, Brian Flores after the game. And I'm having trouble Murph finding a place where I think, oh, you know, this is going to fall apart. This is going to go uh, sideways. The only thing with Sam Darnold though, is that throughout his career, the reason he still has this opportunity is that there have been situations where he has played well through a couple of games and he has led a game winning drive or he's gotten a win. And then it is regressed from there. I think that's the the biggest thing is like, how high do you want to get on the Sam Darnold train uh, or whatever? Uh, you know, how high in the air do you want to go on the Sam Darnold plane? Maybe uh, when he has had these runs before, because he does have this level of talent. I just think the difference is that he has a coach who is, very interlocked with him. And I'm not sure that he ever had that before. Right. And I don't think uh, the, the Vikings or even O'Connell are being, they're not putting too much weight on him, his shoulders right now. I think that's key. And it, and it looks like this is a team that can lean on its defense if it needs to. It doesn't have to be uh, delivered to ecstasy by, by Sam Darnold every week. I don't think he's, sh- you know, it'd be great if you could see an attempt like he had you know, 55 yards down the field, but I don't think that's going to be a play that's either dialed up or even possible to be dialed up week after week. If it's there, take it. Um, but I, you know, there's still, th- there's still some things that, you know, you're like, okay, well, th- th- they still had some turnovers. still, there's still too many penalties right now. I mean, that's probably to be expected early in the season. I mean, as you said, no one's perfect. I think there's plenty to clean up, but these aren't devastating uh, mistakes that they've made. Uh, they haven't cost them dearly uh, in a game, in a moment. Uh, they could. I mean, that I, again, I keep thinking the Aaron Jones fumble at the goal line, uh, you know, how much that could have cratered that game. It didn't. So, I and, and the, again, there are more question marks than answers right now coming out of the, the trainer's room. Uh, I mean, you still have Jefferson had to leave in the third quarter with a quad injury. I think everybody holding their collective breath that it was a knee or an ankle. He comes out and says, no, nah, not a big deal. I'll be ready to go next week. Well, I'll take that with a grain of salt in a post-game locker room on Sunday, see how he practices. Uh, will he be limited? What kind of uh, impact is that going to have on his speed? We all know that hamstring injury last year didn't seem like it was going to be as long as it was, and it ended up being, what, six weeks? Um, you still have Jordan Addison status uncertain. Um, but you look at that receiving depth, and boy, you get Naylor making a huge play, uh, Powell making some plays. I mean, there's just, it doesn't appear that um, they're in a scramble mode to the point where it was like the quarterback carousel last season, where, boy, if they can just get through the next four quarters without blowing up, maybe they can squeak out of here. Uh, this feels like there, there's enough depth, there's enough balance, enough, co- enough complimentary ball on both sides that if, you know, if Jefferson has to sit out a week, if he's a little bit more limited, maybe maybe he's limited to a more decoy next week than he is downfield threat. Uh, I feel like this team is better equipped to handle that. Uh, they're just laying the foundation, I think, uh, mentally, especially to to really kind of to take on some more challenges, to get decked in the in the in the jaw or the chin during a game, to take a punch and maybe be able to counter and not just fold. So these are things that they're building blocks. Long way to go, but um, the manner in which they've pulled out these wins, the confidence in which they're playing, and sort of the cohesiveness on defense, I think that's going to be the prevailing storylines going forward. Folks, U.S. Cellular noticed that the way we use our phones has gotten to be ironic. We try to put our phones down for dinner, but the menu is on a QR code. That's ironic. We hit like on social media posts that we don't actually like. Ironic. Which is why U.S. Cellular has created 
us mode to help us reconnect with each other and use our phones less ironically. A phone company wanting people to use their phones less ironic. Let's find us again with us mode from us cellular visit uscellular.com slash built for us to get started. So as a family man, uh, I don't know if you stayed up late enough to see Caleb Williams's uh, performance last night, but uh, okay. Not great, Murph. Not, Not great. great at all. Uh, I don't know whether to just say Caleb Williams is a rookie, and this is why a lot of teams talk about wanting to sit rookies, but they never can because of the situation. But Caleb Williams looks like he is not ready to play in the NFL to me. It just does not know where to go with the football. He got crushed over and over and over and over. I see people blaming their offensive line. That's not how this works. I know the Texans have a good defensive line. You know who else does? A lot of people. That's not how this works. You have to get rid of the football. And the fact is, Caleb Williams doesn't know where to go with the football. And I don't know if he can't see the field or he isn't prepared and just thinks that he's going to scramble around and make plays. What Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen do is not repeatable, even for somebody who is really, really that physically gifted. And also Allen and Mahomes throw to their first reads a ton and then occasionally make plays. But the way that Williams played last night, I thought that they should be disturbed. I I think that Chicago should be worried about that. That's not to say that, you know, he's not going to develop over the next couple of years. But when, I I mean, I saw worse than what Justin Fields was doing. Uh, Justin Fields had this same problem of not playing in rhythm and with timing of the offense. And I guarantee guys are there available for him to throw the ball to. And he's just hanging on to it and hanging on to it. And then here's Daniel Hunter and here's Will Anderson meeting at the quarterback uh, a bunch of times. And then you start to get concerned about the health of the quarterback. I mean, in a rational world where the whole universe wouldn't just collapse on Chicago, you would just play somebody else who was more prepared uh, because it's been that bad. It's one of the worst starts to a career in terms of yards per pass attempt that any quarterback has had in the last 20 years. That 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 is concerning, I, I think, for Chicago and Caleb Williams. He's talented enough to still be a star, but that looked really, really ugly. Well, and it was I, to me, it was the p- passes that he couldn't complete in the fourth quarter on the sidelines when he did have good protection and he did have an open look. And his receivers had a five-yard window to, for him to just put the ball where it needed to be. And either he wasn't on the same uh, right page uh, with one of his receivers and the other one, uh, he, the ball was nowhere near him. So if he can't make the plays in crucial moments when he is being protected, maybe he's hearing things, maybe he's seeing ghosts. Um I, you know, what's been interesting is because there was so much buildup with obviously uh, being the number one overall pick on hard knocks. There seemed to be showing a lot of good moments. There seemed to be a lot of positive coverage coming out of camp. Um, Then you have Jordan Love go down with an injury that is kind of open ended here. You got some headlines coming out of Detroit where the offense doesn't seem to be in sync. I mean, dare we say Sam Darnold and Minnesota Vikings through two games had the most rock solid quarterback offensive understanding and expectation level and production, the best in the division. It looks that way right now. And I feel like, you know, that's where these are, you know, you don't win divisions and forge playoff success in September, but you can put yourself in bad positions where you're scrambling uh, and not just trying to get victories. I mean, Chicago's one and one. They're certainly not, buried in an, in an 0-2 hellhole. But the way they look right now, it looks like it's going to be an uphill climb all the way with a rookie quarterback. That wasn't the case. we were. That wasn't the sense we had a couple of weeks ago, that there was going to be an ascension there, um, that there was going to be sort of a turnover in the division. It was, good, it was definitely going to be Detroit and Green Bay. Chicago was climbing. And the Vikings were just kind of treading water, is what everybody thought. Well, Again, look where they're at. They're at 2-0. and They're stacking up some chips of house money. And I feel like, you know, these are the kinds of moments that you can look back on in January and say, look, you know, we needed that victory against San Francisco to give us a cushion now. But we also have, you know, sort of the resilience and we have a little bit of the bounce back attitude that we can draw from that right now Chicago clearly doesn't have. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, you know, when you look around the, the division, Green Bay, what an unbelievable coaching job by Matt LaFleur to get the win that they got um, and just run and run and run and run against Indianapolis. 
And with Detroit, I don't have any concern there. You know, that's just no. when you when you have Super Bowl expectations and you have one bad game against what I think is a surprisingly very good team in Tampa Bay, then everyone's going to freak out. You win, you lose by a couple points. Tough game. Uh, that team's really good. I, I think it will continue to be, but it wasn't going to go seventeen and zero. But with Chicago, that's the one where you could be looking at if this just goes down and down and down. Uh, maybe you know the the head coach ends up on the hot seat midway through the season, and you mentioned it, but I was very curious to see how Caleb Williams looked under difficult circumstances and did not look at all like he was ready for this. With the the biggest thing to me was the receivers, the receivers just being like, "Nope, that's not the play, buddy," and that it, he just looks like he's not ready to play in the NFL. And yet they have to force him out there, which uh, as we know from Sam Darnold and other quarterbacks as well, not always the best thing uh, for those guys. So that will be something I think to keep an eye on. There will be probably overreaction to it after two games of his career. And there's been plenty of quarterbacks who have looked horrendous to start and then picked it up. Uh, But that is a low point to be at for uh, Caleb Williams. Murph, great stuff. Always uh, good to talk with you on the morning after to react and go, wait, did everything I say yesterday actually make sense in the morning? And in this case, it seems like it did a great start to the season for the Vikings. And we will be following it along together all season long. So people should check out your article at purpleinsider.com about Sam Darnold. And uh, we'll catch you later. Thanks, Murph. Yeah. Enjoy the ride. Football.